Welcome back to another episode of Is Fitz Happy. I'm Luke. And I'm Emma. This week we're discussing chapter 23 of Ship of Magic, Jamelia Slavers. And it starts out with Wintro, who is free now. He's walking down the streets of Jamelia, and he's just kind of amazed. Having the best day of his life. Yeah, yeah. He says he had not realized how his confinement on the ship had oppressed him until he waded ashore. And he's kind of just reflecting over and over, just like, this is amazing. This is the, this is the, the best thing in the world. And in his head, he proved to himself that he is not a coward. He took the step and did this. And he's free to be a priest once again, which is what he thinks he wants. Right. And we already see him trying to revert back into that priest like mindset where um, he starts to think complaining thoughts about how the water did end up getting to his robe. And so the hem is wet and hitting against his legs and it's chafing because of the coarse material of the robe itself. And then he has to remind himself that, oh, it's not that bad, though, because he Um, is free, but also because, you know, the weather is warmer than it should be, even for a winter in Jamelia. And he is just trying to overcome the, I guess, humanness of complaint by looking for the good. Yeah. And he keeps doing that throughout this whole section of the chapter, just looking for things to be thankful for. Right. It almost feels a little forced. I think when we first are introduced to Wintro, it feels a little bit more natural. And this feels more like him trying to fit back into that piece of the world. Yeah. A little bit. Yeah. But he is free. So he is, that's the selling point of all this is that he is no longer under the tyranny of his father and he is free to make his own choices. And that choice is to go back to the monastery. Yes. And not Jamalia temple or anything like that because he thinks his father is going to look there for him first so he makes the decision to head out to the marrows where his old monastery was and might as well just set out right away but right now he is in the lower part of the city trying to walk through you know the waterfront area he's describing that this area is more dingy than Cress was even and that above everything he can see the bright towers of Jamalia, but he was kind of right about the city, how there is a lot of dirt and things that were hidden when he was back in the harbor on Vivacia looking at the city and seeing it shining. Right. One of the really interesting things is that the water system, the sewage system, is kind of backed up in the streets. And in the area that he's walking, he mentions that there's a lot of broken cutlery and pottery and just trash kind of in the road. And he mentions that his feet are so calloused now because uh, because of his time on the ship. And so it doesn't even bother him. But through that description, we find out just kind of how poorly upkept this part of the city is at least we're not really sure what that means for the rest of the city yet but at least in this area the the sewers are backed up and it smells and it's a mess Mm -hmm. thinking of that comparison between the city from the harbor on vivacia and now he's his mind kind of drifts towards vivacia even to think the name was like a fist to the to his heart how could he have left her He'd had to. He couldn't go on like that. But how could he have left her? He felt torn, divided against himself. Even as he savored his liberty, he tasted loneliness, extreme loneliness. He could not say if it was his or hers. If there had been some way for him to take the ship and run away, he would have. Foolish as that sounded, he would have. He had to be free. She knew that. She must understand that he had had to go. But he had left her in the trap. And he kind of thinks a little bit more about her saying that. uh, Kind of reflecting basically on that same conversation that he had with Vivacia. is like, well, she's not my wife or my child or anything, but I have this love for her. Right. And I'm hoping that she can forgive me. And I know that she'll forgive me eventually. We just need time away. And 
through that reflection, he knows that eventually he'll be back. Right. And I think this is where Vivacia truly does know when Tro that they do have this special bond and whether that is by force or by choice on their, both of their ends, something is there and it is still drawing Wintro to Vivacia. And right. even in the midst of this freedom where all he can think about is how excited he is to get to try to be a priest again, there is part of his mind thinking about when eventually he will go back and see Vivacia again. Yeah, and in his mind, it's when Althea takes her rightful place and they can just reminisce fondly about the times that they had, but they would no longer have as intense of a bond. Right. So his conscious is niggling at him a little bit, thinking, did he hold the intent to return as the only way to assuage his conscience? Did that mean, perhaps, that he suspected what he did today was wrong? How could it be? He was going back to his priesthood to keep the promises he made years ago. How could that be wrong? And he's shaking his head mystified at himself. So in his reflection, he knows that he'll be back, but then he has to think about that thought that he holds and like, well, am I just saying that because I feel guilty? And does me feeling guilty mean that this decision is the wrong one to make? So again, we see a torn Wintro. This is not a new (laughs) thing, but this is a different scenario and maybe a little bit torn the other way instead of like, I have to remain a sailor that that doesn't mean I'm, I'm, you know, putting my priesthood aside. So that hurts me. And I'm torn between those two. Now it's, I'm taking up my priesthood, but I'm putting Vivacia aside, but I'm still torn. Right. I think, yeah, I think it's really hard to see Wintro struggle with this, and he obviously does feel guilty. I think he's trying to convince himself that he doesn't, but obviously he does. He's thinking about Vivacia and her hurt feelings and thinking, well, when we're both older, she'll know more and it'll be fine. But it's also kind of the naivety of a child because... Well, I mean, it's not really his fault. He doesn't know how live ship works, but how does he expect Vivacia to do without him or without a Vestrit for that matter? Like she can't sail without somebody. So now she's stuck in this port and without Vivacia sailing, there is no way to pay for her, which means that they're going to default on their loans, which means that his sister could be sold into marriage. And like I said, he doesn't know all that. He's still a kid. He's been kept from that. But in that, there's this distinct like childlikeness of, well, it'll all be better when we're older and she'll laugh and everything's going to turn out okay because I'm doing what I want. And there's not really the thinking through of what that effect actually has. Yeah little selfish child decision here. Yeah. But I do want to say that it is possible for live ships to sail without their blood on them, like Paragon. Mm. He doesn't have a Ludluck on board. He has Brashen and Althea later on True. when they sail. It just someone has to have the connection probably to help their mental. <laughs> right. <laughs> their, their emotional responses and well-being. Right. So there is that. And that and she does not have that with Kyle. So. No, no. So, yeah. So she is trapped here if he doesn't come back. And. Or at least in considerable distress. True. The whole time. Which will be only worse because she has to house slaves on her. So, you know. Right. Worst case scenario for her. But yeah. that's, let's not think about that. <laughs> <laughs> let's think about how Windrow is free now. Yes. And free to move out of the city to go to his priesthood. As we mentioned before, he is skipping the temples up in Jamelia City and reflecting on the city once again that, you know, maybe it's better I don't go to the temples at all because there are so many slums here. I don't know if, you know, Sa's priesthood would even be recognized anymore as like the sanctity and the the protection you can find. From within, so he's just going to head through the city, try to get out of the gate and go. But it is a massive capital city, so he's just wandering through these poor areas. He does also mention that he's specifically not going to the temple because he thinks that's the first place his father will look. And that 
when his father comes there, he won't leave them alone. And so he's not sure that they can turn him away and he doesn't want to bother them in that way. And in that way, I don't know if Wintrow knows his father. He he does stipulate how hard and how fast is his dad going to come looking for him. Right. And we know because we've read this chapter and we're all rereaders here that his dad actually doesn't look for him on his own at all. He goes and buys the stock of As the slaves. sailors look for him. Yeah, which you would think he would know that about his dad by now, that his dad <laughs> isn't going to drop everything to look for him. And yes, his dad wants him on the ship, but I don't th- I don't know. It just feels like a really weird choice to be like, oh, he'll definitely go straight for the temple and not listen to the temple if they tell him no. When, like, we haven't seen him do that. He's only taken Wintro after he is not around any other priest. So, I don't know. It's just an odd choice to me where he's like, no, I'm just going to go through. Especially because this feels like a repeat of Cress. Where he is just... He's not really thinking through decisions. He's not thinking about the dangers of staying to the slums. He's not thinking about what could go wrong in a place where slavery is legal. <laughs> He's just thinking like, oh, this will be the easiest way to sidestep my dad. Right. I don't know. I think for me, it's a little frustrating reading this because I don't know. I think it makes me think of Fitz. And when Fitz is doing something like this, where he's running away from a captor, he is thinking about all these aspects of like, okay, I need to disguise myself. I need to be wary. I can't trust anybody. I need to be on the lookout. I need to be constantly vigilant. And Wintrow's over here like, I'm trying to regain that priest part of me. So I'm just going to think positive thoughts and Ah, walk in the middle of the street. This is actually smart and did get trained properly. (laughs) Yeah, he he has good qualities to him. (laughs) But it's just like you can just really tell the naivety of this 14 year old boy who is. I don't I don't even know if I can say he's not thinking clearly. It just he just thinks it's going to work out. He's just going to walk out of town and he's not thinking about the fact that he doesn't have any money or that he's hungry. He's going to ignore that because that's a human problem and something that saw will fix for him or something, I'm sure. (laughs) So he's walking through these poor areas and seeing once again all of the disrepair in these neighborhoods. He sees, you know, burned down buildings that are just left smoldering and reluctantly gives credence to the rumors he hears about the current satrap. So we hear again about satrap Cosgo and his pleasures that he buys and specifically says many money could be spent only once, perhaps taxes that should have rep- Paired the drains and hired street watchmen had been spent instead on the satrap's pleasures. So before we get into that perspective in the upcoming books, we get more context to the world that, yeah, he is really wasting all of this money. Mm-hmm. And it's from a different perspective, from Wintrow's perspective now. Right. And there's the mismanagement of his kingdom. I mean... Winter talks about how he's always been told about the greatness of Jamalia and he isn't seeing that right now. Right. And I don't know. It's yeah, definitely sad. He talks about how he walks past a neighborhood that is still kind of smoldering where it has just burnt down and the ashes are wet and it smells really bad. And that's like insane to me Mm -hmm. that there's like a part of town that just burnt down and nobody's cleaning it up or rebuilding and it doesn't seem like it was stopped by anything other than maybe rain yeah 15 buildings he estimates and he sees you know all of these like you mentioned before the waterways clogged and the plumbing clogged and that was one of the big jewels and the big you know draws to jamalia it's the capital city it has indoor plumbing for a lot of the public buildings and he's thinking if the outer edge is like this it can't be much better up in the city But eventually he wanders through some of those slums into slightly better areas where vendors are out in the street uh, hawking, you know, different things. The city's starting to come alive a little bit more as the day breaks. And he realizes as people are coming out with the awakening of the day that there are a ton of people here. And that means that it should be pretty easy for him to be able to hide. Yes. Then we jump to Vivacia, who is sitting and docked next to the slavers. And 
She is, of course, distraught. She is missing Wintro here. And we have Kyle basically yelling at her. You must have known when he left. Why didn't you give an alarm? Where did he go? Wood, she told herself. I am only Wood. Wood need not hear. Wood need not answer. Wood should not have to feel. She stared up at the city. Somewhere up there, Wintrow walked. Free of his father. Free of her. How could he so easily sever that bond? A bitter smile curved her lips. Perhaps it was a vestrit thing. Had not Althea walked away from her in much the same way? Answer me, Kyle demanded of her. Torg speaks up, saying, I'm so sorry. We should have kept a closer watch, but who could have predicted this? Why would he run after all you've done for him? All you've wanted to give him makes no sense for a man like me. Ingratitude like that's enough to break a father's heart. The words were spoken as if to comfort, but Fivation knew that every sentence of Torg's commiseration only deepened Kyle's fury with Wintrow and with her. So, yeah, Torg is, as always, horrible. He's the worst. <laughs> he is stirring the pot so that the situation doesn't get better and he can enjoy it more when Wintrow comes back because they're all sure they're going to, or he's, I'm sure, pretty convinced they're going to get Wintro back. But I also think it's a peek into why he's so mean to Wintro. The comment about how after everything that you wanted to give him, I don't know why he would turn that away. Because to somebody like Torg, being handed first mate or captain after two years sounds amazing. That's the best deal you could hope to get. You'd live your life well off for forever. And... He is probably really jealous. Yeah, definitely. And a bully in general. Right. And those words rile Kyle's ire up. And he again screams at Vivacia and grabs a lock of her hair. And she twists around, swift as a snake. Her open hand slapped him away like a man swipes at an annoying cat. He went sprawling on the deck. His eyes went wide in sudden fear and shock. Torg fled, tripping in his fear and then scrabbling away on all fours. Gantry, he called out wildly. Gantry, get up here. He scurried off to find the first mate. Damn you, Kyle Haven, she said in a quiet, vicious voice. She did not know where the tone or the words came from. Damn you to the bottom of the briny deep. One by one, you've driven them away. You took my captain's place. You drove his daughter, the companion of my sleeping days, from my decks. And now your own son has fled your tyranny and left me friendless. Damn you. Interestingly, she curses him to the briny deep, which is, spoiler alert, where he ends up. <laughs> so, profit? I don't know. But... She is very upset in this, and honestly, I'm sure the rest of the crew is a little freaked out by hearing this. Well, I think he's alone up on the foredeck right now. Torg was with him, but ran off to find Gantry, so she's cursing him alone right now. I don't think any of the crew is around him. Well, Gantry is there shortly after. Shortly after, yes. So, I don't know... I I think that people probably are listening. I think this is a thing where he, Kyle's making a big scene. He's yelling at the live ship, which feels like a no-no. I, I am sure that people are eavesdropping. I'm sure there are people doing their duty, quote unquote, really close to this area and can yeah, hear. Maybe. It does say that she says it in a quiet, vicious voice, though. Fair. So I don't know if the return conversation is heard or not. That's fair. But yeah, Kyle, I'm sure, is heard across the deck. Yes. And he is not getting any less angry. He is just getting more and more worked up. But at least now he kind of has some fear in his voice. Yeah. I don't know if reverence is enough to hope for, but... No, no. <laughs> but he is at least a little fearful, which I cannot believe that he tried to pull Vivacia by her hair. That's crazy. Listen to me, woman. He is such, like, so physically horrible to everyone. Even a boat that is, like, triple his size, he's going to try to, like, physically hurt to get her to listen to, which 
as far as we know, it doesn't hurt her at all when he does this. She doesn't mention that she right. feels a tugging or pain. And she does very easily swat him away. But like Paragon kind of feels pain though. Yeah. With the rocks and, and everything like that. So I'm sure it felt vaguely uncomfortable or something. Right. <laughs> I don't know. Just like something really weird. And I don't know. It's just ugh. Yeah. He is not a good person. We're just reminded again, he's not a good person. Like you said, Gantry does come up onto the deck, saying a safe distance away from the captain and the figurehead, saying, I respectfully suggest you come away from there. You can do no good, and I fear much harm. Our best efforts should be made to search for the lad now before he goes too far and hides too deep. He has no money nor friends here that we know of. We should be in Jamelia City right now, putting out word that we are seeking him. And offer a reward. Times are hard for many folk in Jamelia. Like as not, a few coins will have him back on board before sunset. Kyle made a show of considering his words, but Vivacia knew where he stood was almost within her reach as a show of boldness. So he's trying to show that he has no fear, but it's not quite within her reach either. Right. And he's trying to... Trying to show that he's considering those words and eventually show that he's in control by taking him into consideration and then nodding to Gantry, saying, Your suggestion has merit. Direct all crew members who have short time to put out the word that will give a gold piece for the boy returned safe and sound. Half a gold piece in any other condition. A silver of word of where he is. If such word helps us take him ourselves. I'll be taking Torg and heading down to the slave marts. The damn boy's desertion has caught me an early start this day. No doubt the best stock will be taken already. I might have had a whole company of singers and musicians if I had been down there early on the morning we arrived. Have you any idea what Jamalian singers and musicians would have been worth in Chalced? He spoke as bitterly as if it were Gantry's failure. He shook his head in disgust. You stay here and see to the modifications in the hold. That needs to be completed as swiftly as possible. And Kyle kind of sweeps off. He's not looking at Vivacia at all. But Gantry meets her eyes once and makes a little gesture that she doesn't really know what it means, but it's kind of just like, wait, I'll be back. And Kyle sweeps off into the city eventually. Right. What's really weird about this to me is that Kyle's like, I missed out on my opportunity for the good slaves. Especially because later in this very chapter, we find out that slaves are just always here. I don't know if today is like the fresh stock that are being put in, like new people that just got sold into slavery or like why he thinks he wouldn't be able to still get a ship full of the good slaves, quote unquote. It just seems odd to me. I don't understand. I don't understand why you would want slaves to buy slaves human beings in the first place but like in this logic does that mean that if they were a day late in coming in like the tides were bad they would have missed out on all the slaves like how does the market i don't understand i don't know it seems like he's looking for a reason an excuse to be super angry but also if there are you know sought after slaves i'm sure they get sold first Right, I guess. But then couldn't you just wait till the next day when there's new sought after slaves? No idea. I don't know. It's, the, the the whole thing doesn't make sense to me. But I also hate that like that's his main focus is like, oh, I lost out on being able to buy people because my son is missing. I'll give half a gold coin if people bring him in beat up. That doesn't even say alive. It just says get him back to me in any condition and you get half a gold coin. I don't know. He's such a bad person. We should also say that Kyle does try to threaten Vivacia by saying that he'll make her sorry. And she says he can't make her more sorry than she already is because he's taken away the only people that she cares about. Yeah. That happens before Gantry comes back to the, right. the front board or as he's coming up there. So Maybe he does hear that part. Right. His dumb little act of defiance of like, <laughs> see, I'm brave. I'm basically where I was standing before, except now I'm not in her arm reach. It's like, okay, coward. Doesn't make any difference if you're right there or 10 feet away. Either way, she can't reach you. Right. Whatever. Anyway, 
he's gone now. Going to go buy human beings as though they're livestock. <laughs> and Gantry comes back to the deck. Stopping well short of her, saying, Ship, Vivacia? You needn't be afraid to approach me, she told him sulkily. Despite being one of Kyle's men, he was a good sailor. She felt oddly ashamed to have him fear her. I but wanted to ask, is there anything I can do for you? To ease you? He meant to calm her down. No, she replied shortly. No, there is nothing. Unless you wish to lead a mutiny, she stretched her lips in a semblance of a smile, to show him she was not serious in her request. At least, not quite yet. Can't do that, he replied quite solemnly. But if there's anything you need, let me know. Need. Wood has no needs. He went away as softly as he had come, but in short time, Findo appeared to sit on the edge of the foredeck and play his fiddle. He wasn't playing the usual lively tunes that he usually did. Instead, he played soothingly, tunes with more than a tinge of sadness to them. They were in keeping with her mood, but somehow the simple sound of the fiddle strings echoed her melancholy, lifted her spirits, and lessened her pain. Salt te tears rolled down her cheeks as she stared at Jamalia. She had never wept before. She had supposed that tears themselves would be painful, but instead they seemed to ease the terrible tightness inside her. And she can feel inside of her saws working, drills working, men are working to shape her hold to bring slaves aboard, to bring humans aboard. So I think it's really interesting that we have here Vivacia crying. That's such a human thing. And from what we can tell, she has real tears. Well, they're salt water. But I mean, aren't all tears salty? So it's really weird that she can cry, right? I don't, I don't understand what live shifts are. They freak me out a little bit, not going to lie. Fe feeling very not of saw at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> not my saw. <laughs> not my saw. <laughs> But either way, she is really going through it, and I do feel bad for her. But we actually do get to see another little glimpse of Gantry not being the worst. He's trying his best to help a live ship, which is kind of surprising because as far as we know, he doesn't really have any connection to live ships. No, but I mean, if you're a sailor in Bingtown. I guess you know but isn't Gantry like, oh no, Torg's the one who has the slave trading. Yep, that's why background. they went together. Okay. Yeah. That's okay. Yeah. So, yeah, Gantry this whole time has, as was pointed out by one of our listeners, um, is a decent person. Yeah. Well, he was pretty rude to Althea. Let's, <laughs> we shouldn't diminish sure. that. He did not respect Althea in the least. And, I mean, to be fair, I don't know if she did anything to earn respect, but he did kind of bully her. So he's and not was like... And was obeying his captain to keep her off, you know, off the ship, basically. True, true. When she was on docks. That's fair. But yeah, so I don't know if he's the best, but he isn't the worst. And compared to his two counterparts that are also in charge, he's he's a saint. <laughs> <laughs> And I think it's really interesting that he made the call to bring the fiddler out to sit with Vivacia. And seems to be helping a little bit. Yeah, it does. But Vivacia is still thinking inwardly about all this. It doesn't fix anything, it just helps the terrible tightness, as she says. And she thinks, you know, they're they're changing the inside of my hold for slaves. Wintrow had believed slavery to be one of the greatest evils that existed in the world. But when he had tried to explain it to her, she could not see much difference between the life of a slave and the life of a sailor. You know, how could it be much worse than a slave as a sl sailor? She had not been able to grasp it. Perhaps that was why Wintrow had been able to leave her so easily. Because she was stupid. Because she was not, after all, a human being. Tears welled afresh in her eyes, and the slaver Vivacia wept. So here she is, you know, feeling very down about herself as well, looking for some excuse and the very childlike, it must be me. You know, it's me right. why, why this is happening. I don't even know if that's childlike. I think that's human. 
It's human. Yeah. I, I just immediately go to kids asking why, like, did you guys get divorced because of me? Right. You know? Yeah. To their parents. Like that's an immediate kind of thought, but yeah, I, I can see it's definitely human too, but I'm more playing on Vivacia is months old at this point. Right. Yeah. It's, I don't know. It's hard and it's sad because she has to go through this and then on top of that is being fitted into a slave ship. Right. Like, which she doesn't even fully understand. And we know later that Wintrow himself didn't fully understand slavery before his encounter with the slaves in He's the slave been quarter. Very sheltered in his life. He's just been told it's bad. And it's such a child thing to hear that something is bad. And then not fully grasp that. But to understand, you know, you you can know what's right from wrong without fully understanding why. But you can see that his unsureness of what actually tr- it truly means to be a slave, what it really looks like to see slavery, is then passed on to Vivacia, where she's like, I don't really see a difference between slavery. And I don't see how slavery could be that bad. Because... She's just kind of getting a textbook definition. And if you're not thinking about the human beings who are suffering, or if you're even under the impression that the human beings who are slaves all did something to deserve to be in that position, like it's going to feel lesser than what it actually is. And to be like, well, you know, sailors, they sail their whole life for a master who decides when they stop. So, how is that different than slavery without realizing that? With slavery, there is no free will. There is no, you didn't choose to become the slaver. You don't get to go off the the deck whenever you want to. It's, that's your whole life. And there's no like gravity to that. And so it's even more heartbreaking that she's about to have to have all these slaves on her deck because that will be a very awful wake up call. And being able to feel all those emotions as well. Yeah, the misery. Well, then we move on to Captain Kennet and Sorkor, who are chasing a slaver at this very moment. Sorkor, of course, is very excited to get going. They can see the ship itself and don't really know much about it, but Sorkor immediately can tell, like, yep, that's a slaver. Masts are super tall. They want to carry, like, go as fast as possible with the load that they have to sell them in good conditions. And... He shoots Kenneth a pleased grin, saying, or perhaps the slavers are learning they have something to fear. Well, run as they may, they won't outdistance us. If we put on some sail now, we'll be on her as soon as she rounds the point. Kenneth is kind of discussing what they should do. They're, they're talking tactics of where they should go and says it has a plan basically to preserve the ship, doesn't want to put a hole in the ship and run her aground into shoals or anything like that wants to preserve his extra ship to add to his fleet because it's Kenneth and he doesn't really care about the slaves still. He understands the tactical usefulness of freeing slaves, but wants that ship for sure in good condition. And Sorkor says into the air, (laughs) Robin Hobb says he's not quite sure who he addresses, but says into the air. When we take a slaver, it's usually pretty bloody. Serpent snapping up bodies is not a fit sight for a woman's eyes, and slavers always have a snake or two in their wakes. Perhaps the lady should retire to her cabin until this is over. Kenneth glanced over his shoulder at Ada. It now seemed to him that any time he came on deck, he could find her just behind his left shoulder. It was a bit disconcerting, but he decided the best way to deal with it was to ignore it. He found it rather amusing that Sorkor would refer to a whore so deferentially and pretend that she needed some sort of sheltering from the harsher realities of life. Etta, however, looked ne- neither amused nor flattered. Instead, there were deep sparks in her dark eyes and a pinch of color at the top of each cheek. He's, uh, he describes that she's wearing very sensible clothes today. And, of course, these are some that she has made herself, as we've talked about in the previous chapter. Right. But not just um, that she's made herself, but they are more like what the other sailors are wearing. It's a more coarse material. It's more... Woolen trousers and jacket. Right. It's it's definitely more utility 
than it is fashion. It still looks nice on her, he thinks, but it's more of something that she could use to do something in. Yeah, and uh, new boots as well. And a gaudy scarf confined her black hair, leaving only the glossy tips free to brush across her wind-reddened cheeks. Had he not known Etta, he might have mistaken her for a young street tough. She certainly bristled enough at Sorcourt to be one. So she's fitting right in with the crew. Uh, as Kenneth mentions that he never gave her boots, but she had mentioned something about gaming with the crew to get some. Right. So <laughs> Etta's living her best life. Yeah. She is fitting really, right in. Yeah. Really excelling at being a pirate, basically. <laughs> at least looks wise. But also, I mean, if she's gambling with the crew, clearly attitude wise, too. <laughs> And Kenneth responds saying, I think the lady can discern what is too bloody or cruel for her taste and retire at that time. He observes dryly. A small cat smile curved at his lips as she brazenly pointed out, If I enjoy Captain Kenneth by night, surely there is little I need to fear by day. Sorkor flushes red, scars standing white against his blush. But Etta only shot Kenneth a tiny sideways glance to see if he would preen to her flattery. He tried not to, but it was pleasing to see Sorkor discomfited by his woman's bragging of him. He permitted himself a tiny quirk of his lip acknowledging her. It was enough. She saw it. She flared her nostrils and turned her head, his tigress on a leash. So she is, as we mentioned before, learning very well how to act around Kenneth, not only to not upset him, but to entice him further and the charm really, really did work in the last chapter, tying her to him in a way. And the not not showing my love in public or whatever that the charm talked about is very is working very well. <laughs> right. And I think we don't know how much the charm is talking to Edda whenever we're not privy right. to the conversations. So potentially the charm has had a couple weeks more now to work on her. I like to imagine that was the only time of what we're shown, but maybe not. Yeah, I don't know. It's hard to tell. Either way, things are working really well for their relationship, much to Kenneth's lack of care or doing anything. Right. Um, but it's helpful to him to have, I guess, this image. Yeah. And... With his compliments and saying the right thing about Etta, like saying, yeah, you can, she can stay and she can decide herself, basically giving her agency. Right. Uh, good old, as we know him, feminist Kenneth. Right. Like what? <laughs> oh, I mean, good for him. This is a, a like a great take. But also, I think it's mainly because he doesn't want Sorkor seeing her as a lady. Right. Like it, it's for the wrong reasons, of course. Right. But I know it's so weird because on the one hand, I'm like, yeah, you're right. The lady can decide. And then on the other hand, I'm like, Ugh, I hate I hate your reasoning. I don't want to praise <laughs> you for anything like. <laughs> so we, the attention turns back to this ship that they are chasing the slaver here. It is a ship that has long been a slaver. It looks like there are stains all over it. It's not very well upkept. And there is a tent on the deck with uh, slaves and crew members in that that they can see. Well, at this point, they're not sure. They think it must be crew. Right, to escape some of the stench. Right. They also talk about how they're going to approach the ship by pretending to be a merchant vessel themselves. So they get rid of Kenneth's flag and they run up a merchant flag they have stolen from a different ship right. and put some ropes out and hide their crew and make sure the crew that are seen don't have weapons to really play pretend until they can get close enough to attack. Mm -hmm. And they do get close enough to eventually see that the people on deck were mostly slaves. Interestingly, Kenneth is still calling the slaves cargo. He doesn't really refer to the slaves as people in his own mind ever whenever he's thinking of it it's always that they're cargo which i find particularly interesting because he has convinced he's convinced everybody else that he does care about the slaves and the people that have been you know 
put in this position and yet in his own mind where nobody else can hear he's like ugh the cargo stinks right yeah he's he's kind of reflecting on why they might be on deck saying i wonder if there's sickness down below or if the slaver is just giving them a breath of fresh air he never knew he had never known a slaver to worry solely about his wares comfort so he's kind of wondering about the sickness now about how that would affect his own crew i'm sure right Sorcor is, of course, uh, closing the distance between the two of the ships, and Kennet makes the decision to lead the men this time, saying that he wants at least three of the crew alive, officers preferably. I have a question or two I'd like to answer before we feed them to the serpents. Sorcor is, of course, like, yeah, you, you can do that, but the men are going to be really bloodthirsty to kill all these people, but I'll pass the word. And <laughs> Kennet, of course, is like, I want three of them. Right. Like, Make sure they don't mess it up. To be fair, like, there's got to be a reason. So you would think that his crew would be like, fine, right. as long as they still <laughs> die. <laughs> Etta asks, why do you choose to risk yourself waiting for Sorkor to be out of earshot? Risk? He considered it a moment and then asked her, why do you ask? Do you fear what would happen to yourself if I were killed? The lines of her mouth went flat. She turned aside from him. Yes, she said softly, but not in the way you think I do. Etta knows that with Kenneth gone, Kenneth thinks that she's going to like have to fall back to her whore ways or like the crew or something is going to be right. really bad or whatever. And she's like, yeah, I do fear what would happen if you're gone because I'm in love with you. Mm -hmm. and Kenneth, of course, has no consideration for that whatsoever. Right. And I mean, it's it's aptly put to be like, what, are you scared I'm not going to be here to protect you from the rest of my crew? But I don't know. It's like so gross that he knows that's something at play. <laughs> I don't know. But it is really odd. Why do you think he decides to lead this one? I don't know. Maybe his luck just has a feeling. He's like, this time I need to go over. I was wondering if maybe he's kind of showing off for Etta. Mm, could be, yeah. I know that he doesn't admit to himself that he likes her at all. He likes her flattery and stuff, though, so you yeah. get little flashes of that. So I could definitely see him being like, okay, she wants to watch the, the carnage. Let me be the one to do it, too. Yeah, that's fair. We have a break here but it, we stay with Kenneth and the ship and they are within distance now to hail each other the captain of the Cicerna called to them across the water stand off we know who you be no matter what flag you show Kenneth shrugs the masquerade ends early hands on deck Sorkor bellowed cheerfully and heave the ropes up so all the pirates crowd the rails, grappling lines and bows ready, and Kenneth cups his hands to his mouth, yelling, You may surrender! For an answer, the man barked some command of his own. Six stalwart sailors abruptly seized an anchor lying on deck. Screams sounded as they hove it over the side, and in its wake, as swiftly as if they had eagerly leaped, went a handful of men who had been manacled to it. They vanished instantly, their screams bubbled into silence. Sorkor stared in shock. Even Kennet had to admit a sort of awe at the other captain's ruthlessness. That was five slaves, bellowed the captain. Stand off, the next measure of chain has twenty fastened to it. Kennet says probably the sickly ones he didn't expect to last the journey anyways. And from the other deck, he can hear pleas from the, the slaves kind of shouting. Right. And this is really getting to sore core. Of course, Kennet is kind of... Yeah, like, just the cargo. Enamor enamored. <laughs> yeah, like, he's like, wow, it's like, interesting ideas. I'll take that into consideration. Like, I I'm really impressed. And Sorkor is, like, horrified because human lives are being lost for no reason. And <laughs> Ken is just like, huh, love that. <laughs> it's crazy. Um, but Sorkor is a little thrown off. He doesn't know what to do. He doesn't know what move to make, even if these are sickly slaves that maybe wouldn't have made the journey. It's still people and Sorkor knows that. And so he is rightfully horrified. And so is a lot of the crew. Yeah. 
Sorkor has agony on his face, kind of makes the decision to go ahead anyways, and they send the 20 men over the side. And then it says, Sorkor kind of groans, Kennet, his face pale with horror and shock. Kennet says, how many spare anchors can he have? As he sprang to lead the boarding party, over his shoulder as he flung back, you were the one who told me you would have preferred death to slavery. Let us hope it was their preference as well. So he's just like, we're going to kill the slavers anyways. Right. What are we going to do? Let them go? <laughs> let's, let's go get my ship. Right. And, you know, feed them all to the one serpent that's following them. Yeah, it's, it's really strange because on the one hand, Kenneth does have a point by saying how many spare anchors could they possibly have. Like they're not like <laughs> sure they did that, but like to what end? Because they know that Kenneth's not going to let them go, and he he makes Kenneth does make the right decision here, right? Well, because you can't really negotiate with somebody who's willing right. to throw away lives like that. Like I don't know, people were going to die either way. Like yeah, it's horrible, but at least some of them will be saved rather than none of them, and I think that's. The way it comes across to Sorcor, which I think Kenneth's more just like, who cares? <laughs> but at least he says it in a way that rallies the men. I right. Guess. Yeah. Well, he leaps on deck to finish off the crew. And I'm sure the crew is very eager now rallying to them. Right. And he again snarls like leave three alive. And Kenneth makes his way and finds three of them in a side boat trying to escape. The captain levels a crossbow at his chest and Kenneth loses respect for him. He had been far more impressive when he acted instead of threatening first. And then arcing up from the water came the sinuous neck of the serpent. So the captain kind of swings his crossbow from Kenneth over to the serpent and shoots him in the eye. <laughs> Right. And Kenneth uses that opportunity to jump on board the boat, saying that, well, before he jumps on the boat, he tells them, come with me now or I'll uh, break your boat so that you are fed to the serpents. Right. And the captain says, fat chance, like, I already know you're going to kill me anyway, so I'd rather t try my luck with the serpents. And then he starts sawing at the rope. Yes. To try to just drop the boat in. And so Kenneth jumps in the boat and puts his knife to his neck and says, get on board now. Yeah. The other the other sailor that was in the boat with the captain doesn't agree with the captain's decision there. <laughs> and he flings himself from the dangling boat back to the ship's deck. Kenneth disables him and then jumps onto the boat to threaten the captain, saying, right. like, get back or die right here. So the seized up block and tackle suddenly broke free and one end of the suspended boat dropped abruptly, spilling men into the sea, even as the serpent once more erupted to the surface. Kenneth, lithe and lucky as a cat, sprang clear of the falling boat. One hand caught the railing of the Cicerna and the, then the other. He was hauling up his dangling legs when the serpent lifted its head from the water to regard him. Its ruined eye ran ichor and blood. It opened its maw wide and screamed, a sound of fury and despair. Its blinded eye faced towards the men who struggled in the water, while Kennet dangled before the good eye like a fishing lure. Frantically, he swung one leg up over the railing and hooked it there. As softly as a well-trained pet takes a tibbet from its master's fingers, the serpent closed its jaw on his other leg. It hurts, and he kind of describes that a chill kind of spreads from it and numbs the whole thing, so relief springs from that. But he felt his leg relax, and then the numbness was flung higher. His scream died away to a groan. And he hears a shriek, no, coming from Etta, and she rushes across the deck. So what's really interesting is that we're getting what it feels like to be attacked by a serpent. So they have venomous mouths and spit, as we know, and apparently that venom numbs you so that it's, I guess, not painful, which... That happens in nature as well. Yeah? 
Yeah. Uh, I mean, a lot of like flies and mosquitoes kind of do that too. They just like, so, so you can't feel them bite you, you know? Well, I suppose. Or they like bite you and then they kind of subdue their, their prey, you know, other animals. Mm. It does happen. It does occur in real life. Probably not the same as this. Right. <laughs> but it's something similar. Yeah. Well, also something that's weird to me is that this serpent is so big. Like I'm picturing these serpents to be longer than the ship and like half as wide, like half the width of a ship. And then I'm thinking about the size of a human leg. And even if Kenneth's tall, like that's such a small target for such a big mouth. Like I'm thinking of like, I don't know, like almost like a worm, but that like the head opens up, you know, I don't know. Like, I guess I'm thinking of Dune, the new movie oh, with the big sandworm okay. where they have the big mouth like that. Yeah. And that's what's in my head. And so I'm like, that think, feels like it's too big. I to- think that scale is a little bit bigger. <laughs> But maybe not by, not by much. I don't know. Yeah, so it's like just odd to me that one leg could be bitten and it stops at like the knee. I, I don't know. That just feels weird. I mean, it is described as, you know, as softly as a pet taking a tidbit from its master's fingers. So it's very, very gentle little <laughs> nibble and grab. A good little pup. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So Etta springs across after watching from the deck of the Marietta. No one blocking her way. She runs over looking for, you know, uh, an impromptu weapon. And she has like a boarding axe or a kitchen cleaver or something. Some reflex made him cling to the ship's railing with all his might. That was not much anymore. Strength had fled him. Whatever venom the serpent had put into his wound was already rendering him helpless. When Etta seized him in a wild embrace that also included the ship's railing, he scarcely felt her grip. Let him go, she commanded the serpent. He kind of insults the serpent a little bit more, but the enfeebled serpent, who is in the process of dying because a crossbow bolt went through its eye to its brain, is tugging on his booted leg, stretching him out over the water. And Etta is pulling back. He He saw more than felt the serpent set its teeth more firmly. Like a hot knife through butter, those teeth sheared through flesh and muscle. He had a glimpse of exposed bone, looking oddly honeycombed, where the serpent's saliva ate into it. The creature turned its great head like a hooked fish, preparing to give a shake that would either tear him loose from the railing or snatch his leg from his body. Sobbing, Etta raised her weapon. Damn you, she screamed. Damn you, damn you, damn you. Her puny blade fell, but not as Kenneth had expected. She did not waste the blow on the serpent's heavily scaled snout. Instead, the blade cracked loudly against his weakened bone. She severed his leg just below the serpent's teeth, cutting it off, a nice bite, as it were, and hauls him back on on the deck. And the serpent is dying as that happens. He dimly hears the awe-stricken cries of his men as the serpent raised its head still higher and then collapsed suddenly back into the sea, boneless as a piece of string. It was dead, and Etta had fed it his leg. Why did you do that? He demanded of her faintly. What have I ever done to you that you would chop my leg off? Oh, my darling. Oh, my love. She was caterwauling, even as the darkness swirled around him and took him down. So (laughs) Kenneth's kind of delirious right now. He's uh, numbed by the serpent and basically is like, he's in shock. He's like, why would you cut off my leg? Right. Even, Even right before his thought is, The serpent's going to shake me, either shake me from the railing, shake me loose, or take my leg off. And then she takes his leg off. He's like, why would you do that? Yeah, like, (laughs) you could have saved it. It was dying. Very smart action on her part. Right. I also think he carries that grudge on a little bit later, like brings it up to her a couple times. Right. Of like, (laughs) you did this. Harbors some resentment. Yeah. Which is so stupid because she did save his life. Very illogical. Yeah. But... Interestingly, his foot that he used to destroy the gift of the sea was indeed taken by the sea. Yes. Yeah, that's true. So maybe think ne- twice next time you're on the beach <laughs> and see something you want to smash. <laughs> yeah. 
So loses his leg. He loses his leg, and thanks to Edda, he's still alive. But he is passed out, and that is the end of that. And gushing blood. (laughs) And gushing blood. Surprisingly, he survives. (laughs) Spoiler alert. (laughs) (laughs) Well, one more time, we head back to Jamalia and Wintro, who who has arrived in the slave mart and is walking through and, and describing terrible, absolutely horrid things here. But... He's keeping his head down, kind of walking through. And he talks to himself saying he could no more break their chains than they could. Even if he had been able to undo their fetters, what then? He could not erase the tattoos from their faces, could not help them flee and escape. Evil as their fates were, it was best if he left each one to face it and make the best he could of it. So he's of the opinion now of like, head down, keep going. It's on their own. I can't do anything. I do want to say he knows his dad is here to buy slaves. So it's an odd choice to me that to avoid his dad, he goes through the slave market. (laughs) I like, I don't understand the thought process there. I don't understand why you'd be like, Oh, he's going to be looking for me. So he definitely won't be shopping and nobody from the ship will be here where they intended to go the whole time. The reason we're here, it just is such a weird choice. I hate it. Like, I hate that there's slavery in this book at all, but I hate that Wintro is like, yeah, I'm a free man. The first thing I'm going to do is go straight to where my dad's going to be in a few hours. (laughs) What? (laughs) Because it doesn't seem like he like he doesn't make any mention that he came here accidentally or he wasn't meaning to or he wanted to avoid this area. This is just part of the slums that he's hiding out from his dad in. Well, he's trying to walk to the gate. He's trying to walk out. So maybe it was just on the way, you know, I guess. I don't know. But he's trying to get through it. He's trying to just keep his head down and walk through. And he notices a man with a wheelbarrow, a few bodies in it, and a woman crying behind him saying, like, let me just have his body. Like, let me have my son's body so we can bury it. Please, please, what good is it to you? And Wintro stared after them, wondering if perhaps the woman was crazy. Perhaps it was not her son at all, and the man with the barrow knew it. Or perhaps, he reflected... Everyone else in the street was crazy and had just seen a heartsick mother begging for the dead body of her son and had done nothing about it, including himself. Had he so swiftly become inured to human pain? He lifted his eyes and tried to see the street scene afresh. So going into this, he, like I mentioned, head down, ignore it. This is terrible, absolutely horrible, but I can't do anything. Let's go through. And reflecting a little bit more, he wants to see the scene with new eyes and he looks up and it pretty much overwhelms him with its horrid <laughs> realness. Yeah. yeah. I kind of, this is something I don't like about Wintro. He goes back and forth between too serious and too naive. And in this first part where he's keeping his head down, it's so like childlike of like, well, there's nothing I can do, so I might as well not bother. And, like, their fates are going to be fine. Like, some of them will be free, and some of them will have fulfilling lives. And so I'll just think about that to make myself feel better about doing nothing. But then on the other hand, he's, like, looking with fresh eyes and being like, oh, look at all the horrors here. And, like, this is horrendous, and I can't believe people are being treated this way, and everybody's just allowing it. He mentions that there's so many different types of slaves being auctioned yeah, and they're and, arranged by you know age sex uh their skin their color skin colors their jobs or mm-hmm. if they're like proficient in anything there's tattooists just advertising their wares with a a boy who is chained to a stone covered in tattoos who is saying the pitch of the tattoo artist yeah and then there are people that are you can tell that some of the slaves that are the like good ones i guess the ones that have the skilled ones yeah the skilled ones they seem to take a pride in the fact that they are worth more and there's just it's just a fact of life and and he, he mentions that he says no one else seemed disturbed by it some might hold a lace kerchief fastidiously to the nose distressed by the odor 
They did not hesitate to demand a slave stand or walk or trot in a circle, the better to inspect him. You know, like, it's just a part of life. And he's looking about like, no one is disgusted by this. No one thinks this is out of the ordinary. It seems that in the eyes of the buyers, a failure of finances instantly changed a man from a friend or neighbor into merchandise. And he also mentions that it seems like the motto of this area is why hire what you could buy outright. Right. That that's the philosophy these people are going by. It is a horrific picture that Hobb paints in Jamalia here. And going down to the details of, you know, there's slurs called map faces for slaves that are not as behaved and so they've passed from hand to hand, from master to master, and have gotten more tattoos that way. And they're worth less now and can be brutalized more easily because they're not tractable. You know, it's just... It's more than five tattoos makes a slave a map terrible. face, quote unquote. And it means that they're probably surly. And we're not, we don't ever stop to talk about why they might be surly about right. being a slave. Like... <laughs> Like, they're just disagreeable, and you wouldn't want them anymore. It's so sad. Yeah, and it, he, there's there's even, like, talk of how Jamalia not only adapted or, like, took over the culture of Chalcedian tattooing to mark your slaves, but has even improved on it for their own thing. And there's pale tattoos for... You know, entertainers for slave entertainers, so the makeup can easily cover it up, even though sex work is still illegal for slaves, apparently. They're in Wintrow's mind, a 14 year old boy who doesn't know anything about this. Right. He easily sees, like, that's this is what they're sold into slavery for. So it's just horror upon horror that he is walking through and looking at while everyone else just kind of passes by nonchalantly. Holding a handkerchief to their nose because it smells bad. Right. It's it's really interesting. And and I it's hard and I feel bad because while I'm upset that Wintro is kind of like, keep your head down, there's nothing you can do, he is kind of right, and he is only 14. And as much as I'd love him to be a swashbuckling hero and just cut free all of the slaves as he runs by so they have a chance. Like, I also know realistically that's not going to get him very far. Right. And probably most of the slaves are not well enough taken care of where they can fight for themselves yeah. and actually be free. And some of them would probably don't have the will to, I'm sure, mm-hmm. because then they're just going to get beat harder when they are caught. So even with those fresh eyes that he's looking at this scene with, He says it was easier often to see their tattoos instead of meet their eyes. And that's just the reality. And he gets hailed from the side of the the street by a slave, too. And this whole next scene, he's still thinking, like, are they just luring me in to hold me hostage? Are they like, I'm I'm wary of this situation. Right. He mentions that a slave with several tattoos on his face Set, uh, calls to him and says, Please, priest, the comfort of Saw for the dying. Winter halted where he stood, unsure if he were the one addressed. The slave had stepped as far from his coffle as his fetters would allow. He did not look the sort of man who would seek Saw's comfort. Tattoos sprawled over his face and down his neck, nor did he look as if he were dying. He was shirtless and his ribs showed, and the fetter on his ankles had chafed the flesh there to running sores. But other than that, he looked tough and vital. He was substantially taller than Wintrow, a man of middle years, his body scarred by heavy use. His stance was that of a survivor. Wintrow glanced past him to where the owner stood a short way off, haggling with a prospective buyer. The owner, a short man who spun a small club as he talked, caught Wintrow's gaze briefly and scowled in displeasure, but did not leave off his bargaining. So Wintrow is kind of using the slave's tattoos as an indicator of who they are instead of being like a priest and not prejudging. There's that whole prejudgment thing. 
it's this is the the whole thing that Ronica was talking about in her own thoughts. Basically, you know, when she went down Bingtown and saw somebody hit one of their quote unquote servants and nobody reacted and the person didn't react at all. It just made it easier for her to ignore it. And that's what Wintrow's experiencing here. It's so commonplace that you don't want to be the one sticking out. You don't want to like do anything. So he's taking in this whole thing and just kind of socially fitting in and doing the same thing everyone else is doing. Right. But, but not even just that he's also taking the social cues of, well, he looks pretty hardy and he has a lot of tattoos. So he probably doesn't need the grace of saw. Why would I, why would he ask for my help unless he was up to something? Right. Which suspicious. Yeah. He's clearly up to something because he's a map face. And like, that's, that's so unfair because this man, you know, nothing about him. Like, we know nothing about him except for that he asked a priest for help. And in any other setting, Wintro would have helped and not really judged, I think. And because he has slave tattoos and a lot of them, there is that judgment. But despite that, I think Wintro can recognize that in himself. And he says, I was trained to be a priest, though I cannot fully claim that title as yet. And more decisively, he adds... But I am willing to give what comfort I can. He eyes the slaves and tries to keep suspicion from his voice as he asks, who needs such comfort? So he, he makes the conscious decision to like, I, I will help trying to keep the suspicion out because I think he knows that like this isn't right. What I'm doing, what I'm instantly feeling. Right. But I can't help but feel that. And so he heads towards the slaves as the slave backs away and reveals a woman who is hunched over. She looks like she's fit and hearty and shouldn't be dying either. But Wintro can sense like there, there is something here. Like there's some sort of sickness, right? She's hunched over. She's obviously in pain. He asks what's wrong. As he does some tests, he notes that she doesn't have a fever. Her, whenever he pinches her skin, it does slowly go back, which is a sign of dehydration. Um, but she says that she's bleeding and that the owner, her owner, master, whatever, fed her some herbs to loosen the baby in her womb. And she hasn't stopped bleeding since. And Wintrow tries to comfort her. Yeah. And he tries to say, you know, that's normal. Whether you birth a baby or lose the baby, bleeding is normal and you're going to be fine. It, like, this isn't the end for you. You just need some soup, some water, you, like yeah. some rest. And she's like, no, I'm dying. Yeah. she No, he, he gave me too much. A pregnant woman cannot work as hard, you know. Her belly gets in the way. So they forced the dose down me and I lost the child a week ago. And Wintra says, even a flow of bright red blood does not mean death. You can recover. Given the proper care, a woman can, her bitter laugh, cut off his words. He had never heard a laugh with so much of a scream in it. You speak of women. I am a slave. No, a woman need not die of this, but I shall. She took a breath. The comfort of Sa, that is all I am asking of you. Please. She bowed her head to receive it. Perhaps in that moment, Wintrow finally grasped what slavery was. He had known it for an evil, been schooled to the wickedness of it since his first days in the monastery. But now he saw it and heard the quiet resignation of despair in this young woman's voice. She did not rail against the master who had stolen her child's life. She spoke of his action as if it were the work of some primal force, a wind storm or river flood. His cruelty and evil did not seem to concern her, only the end product she spoke of, the bleeding that would not cease, that she expected to succumb to. Wintrow stared at her. She did not have to die. He suspected she knew that as well as he did. She were given a warm broth, bed, shelter, food and rest, and the herbs that were known to strengthen a woman's parts, she would no doubt recover, to live many years and bear other children. But she would not. She knew it. The other slaves in her coffin knew it, and he almost knew it. Almost knowing it was like pressing his hand to the deck to await the knife. Once the reality fell, he could never be the same again. 
To accept it would be to lose some part of himself. He stood abruptly, his resolve strong, but when he spoke, his words were soft. He tries to say, like, I'll go to Saw's temple and help. Maybe they can convince your master that a healthy woman can work more, can be sold for more, you know? Like, maybe we can keep you alive. Right. And his intention is that he's not a real priest. He hasn't really been trained in this, so he needs somebody else's help. And that's not really how the slaves take it. Right. Yeah. The the man who first calls Wintrow over says, small help we shall get there at the temple. A dog is a dog and a slave is a slave. Neither is offered Saw's comfort there. The priests there sing Saw's songs, but dance to the satraps piping. As to the man who sells our labor, he does not even own us. All he knows is that he gets a percentage of whatever we earn each day. From that, he feeds and shelters and doses us. The rest goes to our owner. Our broker will not make his peace smaller by trying to save Kala's life. Why should he? It costs him nothing if she dies. The man looked down at Wintrow's incomprehension and disbelief. I was a fool to call to you. Bitterness crept into his voice. The youth in your eyes deceived me. I should have known by your priest's robe that I would find no willing help in you. He gripped Wintrow suddenly by the shoulder, a savagely hard pinch. Give her the comfort of Saw, or I swear I will break the bones in your collar. Wintrow says, you don't need to threaten me. I am a Saw's servant in this. So we learn a lot about the culture that Wintrow doesn't know. And that shows how naive he is for thinking that he is safe in Jamalia from his father. That this was a good idea to go off on his own without any money or proof of identity. He just is out there that not even the temple is a safe place anymore. And not the way he was thinking where maybe they just have less backing and so they can't really say no to people. That they're corrupt too. Well, the satrap, we learn later that the satrap made it illegal for slaves to get Saw's comfort. So slaves just can't have anything from the priests, really. Right. But still, the priests are going along with it. Right? Like, they have magic powers that can make it easier to die. And instead of using them anyway, they're like, nah, we'll stay safe and not be, not risk becoming the slaves that we're helping will just you know stay in our comfort here or pay for the slaves to be free or whatever like whenever they die or pay the price of the death i don't know it just but the so i agree with you and it could like i wish they would get some backbone and stuff but remember in this the satrap is literally saw's seat in the world right like that is the Mm. ruling seat It is Sa's center in the empire. The satrap embodies all of that. And what his, what he says is not only law, but religious law as well. Yeah. He he rules. It's like the Pope. Like if the Pope said, you know, don't do this, all the priests and the bishops and everything like that in the, in the Catholic church would probably be like, okay, we have to listen to the Pope. (laughs) Yeah. I, it just is like, but that doesn't mean that it's not corrupt right where yeah. here you know what i mean like i feel sure. like at the temple that wintra was from they would still help somebody like this in need yeah i'm sure so i don't know it's like i think there is still corruption but you're right like it's basically the pope being like god told me you can't do this anymore and so like how are they going to be like no actually right. <laughs> <laughs> So I, I think it's it's not as black and white in the city. It's not looking good for the priests here. Like they don't follow everything that Wintro was raised or taught right. as Saw's way. But what else can they really do? They could go in secret, I guess. But like, then they would be a slave. I don't know. <laughs> and they would get maybe funding taken away from the, the temple. I don't know. I mean, are they getting funding if the Satrap has like problems with drugs and <laughs> right you know like i True. don't know either way the man is threatening wintro yes the man is threatening wintro and telling us about how 
people are treated here, like how slaves are treated in this city and what things are looking like now, Mm -hmm. which are things that we didn't know and that Wintrow didn't know because he was sheltered. And Wintrow reassures him that, you know, I'm going to do this willingly. Like I'm not, you don't need to force me or threaten me. But it can't be rushed. Yeah, but you can't like, (laughs) this isn't like a, I'm going to snap my fingers and the guy's like, no, you're going to snap your fingers and do it <laughs> quick because the owner's looking this way. And <laughs> yeah, we need to get out of here. You like. Yeah. Yeah. Let's get this over with. So Wintro kind of hesitates. He has never done this by himself. He's seen it done, but he's never tried it himself. And he's a little nervous. He doesn't really know. He has the pressure of a time constraint and people telling him to hurry up. And so he skips the prayers, he skips the preparations, he skipped the soothing words designed to ready her mind and spirit. He simply stood and put his hands on her. He positioned his fingers on the side of her neck, spreading them until each one found its proper point. This is not death, he assured her. I but free you from the distractions of this world so that your soul may prepare itself for the next. Do you assent to this? She nodded a slow movement of her head. He accepted her consent. And then he does something really weird. Yeah. He aligned himself with her. He reached inside of himself to the the neglected budding of his priesthood. He had never done this by himself. He pressed lightly on the points his fingers had unerringly chosen. The pressure would banish fear, would block pain while he spoke to her. As long as he pressed, she must listen and believe his words. He gave her body to her first. And to you now, the beating of your heart, the pumping of air into your lungs, to you, the seeing with your eyes, the hearing with your ears, the tasting of your mouth, the feeling of all your flesh, all these things do I trust to your own control now, that you may command them to be or not to be. All these things I give back to you, that you may prepare yourself for death with a clear mind. The comfort of saw I offer you, that you may offer it to others. He saw a shade of doubt in her eyes still. He helped her to realize her own power. Say to me, I feel no cold. I feel no cold, she faintly echoed. Say to me, the pain is no more. The pain is no more. The words were soft as a sigh. But as she spoke them, lines eased from her face. She was younger than he had thought. The pain is gone, she said without prompting. Does some weird priest skill thing. Mumbo jumbo. Yeah. (laughs) And he says he, I I just want to chime in. He says that he doesn't know the mysteries of it, but he knows the mechanics. Right. As he does this. So we don't get an explanation at all. Right. And it's really, really weird. We don't get anything that is similar to the skill in this. There's no reaching for her personhood. He is not inside her doing something. No. The only thing we get is like he aligns himself with her. Yes. And then gives her the power to take control over everything. Which. It feels like trying to like show her like yeah you can detach yourself from this situation basically kind of what he did with right. his you know his finger removing himself from the awareness of like shielding himself from that pain a bit i don't know it's really weird it is so weird and it's just for death too yeah so i don't know i mean maybe you could do it without death but it seems like something it it feels like to me Thinking about it with just like the death, it feels like that snipping of the spirit from the body that Fitz has to do when he's dying in the dungeon, Mm. right? There's that one little tether that's holding him back. And when he realizes, oh, this body is dead, then he can be like, I can go over to Night Eyes, no problem. Right. And it feels like maybe that's what Wintrow is doing here, just giving the spirit being like, this is your comfort. Like, you can just let this go. And then he talks a little bit later about some some people not being able to accept that they're dying. So the comfort does not do much or some people not being able to let go of the pain. Right. Because so, the pain is the last visage of life. So maybe it's something similar to that where once the person knows 
that the body is gone, that you are for sure dying, accepting it is much easier and therefore you can just let your spirit go. Right. And it gives them control. They get a few moments to be there with their loved ones, not in pain, to say goodbyes and make peace. Yeah. Wintrow mentions that it's something that he sees every time that never ceases to amaze him. But every time a person let go, lets go of the pain, the first thing they do is they open themselves up to Saw's wonder. And beauty, contemplation and beauty. of beauty. Right, which is like a big deal being, I guess, part of their worship culture. Yeah. It's just that you're looking for beauty and oneness. That's like what Saw is, I guess. And so... This the second that you free people from the shackles of pain, they see the beauty around them and they're looking at that. And that is something that really fulfills Wintro in this moment. Yeah. So this is where he kind of talks about how this has happened before. Once a person had realized death, if they could turn aside from pain, they immediately turned toward wonder and saw it took both steps. Wintro knew that. If a person had not accepted death as a reality, the touch could be refused. Some accepted death and the touch, but could not let go of their pain. They clung to it as a last vestige of life. But Kala had let go so easily. So easily that Wintro knew she had been longing to let go for a long time. And he kind of stands by quietly, doesn't speak, not even listening to her words, but just the cadence, her tone, tears coursing down the man's face. Right, because in this moment, Kala, the woman as we know her, is basically telling Lem, the man, that she loves him and that she will miss their time together and to thank the others for helping her get away with doing less work as she's been ill. Yeah. And then eventually says, look at the skies and it's so beautiful. And that's what he's remarking on, right. Sal's beauty. And that's, so it's this like, really heartbreaking moment where you have this couple where one is dying and they're both in this horrible situation where they've they're slaves and they don't have freedom but they have this moment where at least she is granted saw's blessing and he gets to be there and it's just full of love and tenderness and i don't exactly understand why wintrow's still here no yeah like the whole time you were saying, like, he's so naive, like, he's, duh, he's going to get caught. I'm just, like, in my head, at any point, if he just steps away, walks away, he's free. He's got free. Yeah. He just gets away. He just, like, walks away, and he's fine. I, but he just sticks around. It doesn't seem like he needs to be there. He's not touching her anymore. No, he's just listening to the outpouring of love and, like, reveling and enjoy, in this Saz thing. Like, that's... Yeah. His naive part coming in. He doesn't have any street sense whatsoever. Right. And eventually the owner comes over like, hey, what are you doing? Like, what's going on here? And then instead of just being quiet and walking away, like, sorry, I thought because the the owner thinks that he's trying to impregnate her again. Yeah, um, the, the the two slaves. Yeah. Yes. And Wintro is no, he thinks Wintro is trying to impregnate the slave. Mm -mm. No, he, he pushes Wintro out of the way. And then talks to Lem, who is holding Kala upright, saying, get away from her. He spat at Lem. What are you trying to do? Get her pregnant again right here in the middle of the street? I just mm. got rid of the last one. So Wintrow was just like got the there. wind knocked out of him with the, the owner's bat. I guess he's not even the owner, the broker's bat. Right. And, and then he's just curled over himself trying to catch his breath. And then he just stays and... She dies because she's decided to let go because Wintrow has given her, given her Saw's blessing. So she's chosen now she will die. So she doesn't have to deal with this anymore. And then instead of just leaving and being okay with that, he decides to say Saw's peace to you in a whisper at this woman as the broker's freaking out that she's dead. Yeah. So bringing attention to himself. He turns around and says, you've killed her, you idiot. She had at least another day's work in her, which, okay, we'll move past that. Yeah. Like we, we know gross. this whole thing is hideous. <laughs> right. He snaps the bat at Wintro, sharply stinging blow to his shoulder and broke skin and bruised the flesh without breaking bones. From the point of his shoulder down, pain flashed through his arm, followed by numbness. Well-practiced gesture, obviously. He's well accustomed to using that bat. But now, like, it's time to, time to go, Wintro. 
He stumbles into one of the slaves who pushes him casually aside. They were all closing on the broker suddenly with his nasty little bat looking like a puny and foolish weapon. Wintro is kind of disgusted by that. Like, oh, they would beat him to death. They jelly his bones. Like, the broker's going to die here. Right. But this whole time, he's just sitting watching and the broker... Just chilling, waiting for them to take him. I don't... Like... Buddy, you gotta go. You gotta like you did some help, and it's great that you did that. But you need to leave. You should have left after you stopped touching this woman, and you weren't listening to her words anymore because it was right. too intimate. Like, leave, get out. <laughs> and he, the the broker is in control with his bat. He's well practiced, as Wintro said before. But Wintro's just watching him like beat up all of these slaves. And he notices that, you know, a couple people in the slave mart are walking by. Traffic is continuing, but, you know, there's a raised eyebrow or two at this unruly coffle. But what did one expect of map faces and those who mongered them? So folks stepped well wide and continued on their way. Wincho doubted any of them would care. No use calling for help to say he wasn't a slave. So I guess he's trapped in the middle of this. Because he was pushed aside by slaves. I, I don't understand why he, he can't run at this point. Yeah, because he's not chained to anything. He's not, It doesn't say that he's stuck in between the slaves and a wall or something. He's just doubled over. But he could still walk away. Like, the slaves gave you an opening by trying to attack him. Right. You could have used that distraction to just slip away and... And get away from this and nothing would have happened. And instead he just stays and he's like, why won't anybody help? As though he didn't just spend the whole morning walking through the slave market where people are literally here just to buy people like their merchandise. Like, I don't. At some point, the stupidity has to end. Like, no, it continues, actually. No, it does. And uh. <laughs> Because the broker gets his uh, slaves under control, I guess, after hitting Lem really hard again. And then is shaking like the empty fetters that he unbuckles from Kala's legs saying like, I, by all rights, I should clap these on to you. You've cost me a slave and a day's wages, if I'm not mistaken. And then he sees the customer walking off like, see, you cost me a buyer as well. The little man's manner was so acridly pleasant. Wintrow could not believe his ears. A woman is dead and it is your fault. He pointed out to the man. You poisoned her to shake loose a child, but it killed her as well. Murder twice is upon you. He tried to rise, but his whole arm was still numb from the earlier blow, as was his belly. So he was just on the ground the whole time. Just chilling. Reeling. I guess, like, losing your breath does suck. Like, if you get the wind knocked out of you, you can't really move. And his arm, whole arm was numb. But, like, at that point, just crawl it's, away. It's life or death. There's literally slavery happening. You are at risk. And you're like, I'm just going to wait until I feel better because it hurts. Like, no, just go. Like, yeah. Recover somewhere else, <laughs> please, Wintro. <laughs> so he tries to rise up, but the broker kicks him down again, saying, Such words, such words from such a cream-faced boy. I am shocked, I am. Now I'll take every penny you have, laddie, to pay my damages. Every coin now, be prompt. Don't make me shake it out of you. I have none, Wintro told him angrily, nor would I give you any if I had. The man stood over him and poked him with his bat. Who's your father, then? Someone's gonna have to pay. And Wintro so stupid just says i'm alone you know, no one's gonna pay for you i did sal's work i did what was right and like, uh, it's just just oh. say kyle's name say kyle vestrit or kyle uh, haven yeah he's uh, on the vivacia that's where you can find him put the bill there and walk away be a little malta in this say like Here's my dad's number. Yeah. He'll pay for Here's you. his credit card. <laughs> Go ahead and charge him. Oh. How? How is he not like, he's like, I'm alone. Just say you're with Kyle. Like <laughs> He's like, no, I'm prime target to become the next slave. So how about that? Oh. Wintro. <laughs> so, so Wintro says, you know, I did what was right here. And the, the broker says, well, right for her may be wrong for you. You see, in Jamalia, slaves are not entitled to Saw's comfort, so the satrap has ruled. If a slave truly had the soul of a man, well, that man would never end up a slave. Saw, in his wisdom, would not allow it. At least, that's how it was explained to me. So here I am with one dead slave and no day's work. The satrap isn't going to like that. Not only are you a killer of his slaves, but a vagrant, too. If you looked like you could do a decent day's work, I'd clap some chains and a tattoo on you right now. 
Save us all some time. But a man must work within the law. Ho, oh, guard! The little man lifted his bat and waved it cheerily at a passing city guard. Here's one for you, a boy. No family, no coin, and in debt to me for damages to the satrap slaves. Take him in custody, would you? Here, now! Stop! Come back! The last exclamation came as Wintrow scrabbled to his feet and darted away from them both. Only Lem's cry of warning made him glance back. He should have ducked instead. The deftly flung spinning club caught him alongside the head and dropped him in the filthy street of the slave mart. So, he gets knocked out and obviously taken slave here, uh, as we know. <laughs> he gets knocked out, but he gets up again. <laughs> Barely. He should have gotten up faster last time. Ugh. But th- there's your answer, maybe. These slaves here are rented out for a day's work, mm-hmm. and the broker gets paid out of that. So maybe all of these slaves, or most of them, are kind of rented out, and the cream of the crop that gets auctioned off is early on that are actually being sold to be shipped away. Mm. So maybe that doesn't happen every day or maybe a little bit happens every morning. Right. But the okay. rest are just kind of used used up stock, I guess, in a gross way. But that kind of almost feels then like it would just be for, then what's the point of, I don't know. I guess what I'm trying to say is like, Wintrow had that whole thing about like, why hire someone when you could own them outright? Right. So why think that way if it's like a rent system? Like, oh, I'm going to rent a slate. I mean, at least this one was a renting. Yeah, I suppose. But that's more Gross. like general labor, I right. guess. Yeah. Not like poetry or whatever. Yeah. I that Kyle's so. after. Yeah, that comment so, was in yeah. uh, talking about the skilled laborers for yeah. sure. Yeah. So that's why I'm more like, I don't understand how this works. I mean, I hope uh, I never have to know how it works in depth. I don't like it. But Wintro is... As you mentioned before, very naive here. But, oh, man, it's frustrating. I don't even want to talk about it even more. Like, we'll talk it's, more yeah. on the next chapter with him. It's just so frustrating. It's because, just you watch every opportunity he uh, has to make the choice to get out of this town and actually go where he wants to, and he decides not to do it for no reason. Yeah. I truly do not understand the choices he decides to make, any of the choices he decides to make. And <laughs> you know what? Maybe he would have been, maybe this would have happened even if he would have went to Saw's temple because the priests are corrupt. So maybe they would have sold him into slavery for running away from his dad. Like, we don't know. But either way, <laughs> it's bad. He made the worst possible choices. And like, I guess he did one thing good for a dying person, and that's great. And I'm glad that Kala got a last few minutes that yeah, were a like... a miraculous thing. Yeah, like, that's amazing. But also, like, then he stayed when he didn't have to. <laughs> like, what are you doing? For, like, minutes afterwards, because yeah. it describes her talking, thanking them, like, thanking Lem, saying it's beautiful, and then him tuning out and just listening to her voice. Because it's just so beautiful to hear the like, praise it, oh, of beauty from Saw or whatever. Wintro, like, I will smack you. <laughs> okay, Kyle. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, it's Vivacia, actually. Yeah. <laughs> In this moment. Oh, uh, anyways, that's... Uh, this This chapter jumped around quite a bit. Yeah, it's... I don't know. We learned something new about live ships. We had Kenneth lose a leg. And Winter loses freedom that he just earned. <laughs> a very, very depressing chapter. Yeah. From all points of view. So. Thanks, Saw. Things are looking up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thanks, Saw. <laughs> oh. Any final thoughts? We covered a lot. I think the only likable person that I am not frustrated with in this chapter is Edda. Yeah, that's fair. <laughs> Sorkor as well. Yeah, I guess he like, yeah, he wanted to help the 20 people chained. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you so much for tuning in and listening this week. If you have any thoughts about this chapter, if you have thoughts about how the magic works for Saw Priests, please let us know. You can email us directly at isfitshappy at gmail.com or you can comment on any of our posts for our episodes or message us directly on any of our social medias. We're at isfitshappy at Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. We're on YouTube as well, so you can go ahead and subscribe there and comment on those videos if you want to listen to us on YouTube. 
So I'll be with you. You know what's funny about this section? I don't think I would listen to it if I was a podcast listener of ours. <laughs> really? really? I really enjoy doing this. It's my favorite, but I absolutely skip this kind of stuff in other podcasts. <laughs> <laughs> so shout out to all of you who listen and don't skip. <laughs> wow. <laughs> when I'm listening to a podcast, I don't skip anything usually. What? Because I'm... It's a podcast. I just put it on and listen. I'm too lazy to skip it. Oh, no, no. <laughs> Unless I've, I, I have listened to a couple podcasts that have obnoxious, obnoxiously long ad reads. Yeah. Like it's six minutes of just straight ads in the beginning. Sometimes I skip those, but usually I just stop listening altogether. So Yeah, I don't. There's most of the ones that I listen to, I know how long the ad read is. So I <laughs> skip forward in time to when about the ad read should be over. And then I can hear the start of the podcast and then I'm the same at the end. If Like sometimes I listen to like, okay, here's listener stuff. But most of the time I'm like, eh, I heard the stuff I wanted to hear. <laughs> all right. All right. Uh-huh. I don't know. This is a weird, something I thought of as I was getting ready to be <laughs> like, I'm so excited for this. And I'm like, you know, I probably wouldn't even listen to this. <laughs> wow. <sighs> and I'm missing out clearly because. We get cool write-ins, so maybe I should listen to other people's cool write-ins on other podcasts. <laughs> anyway, thank you, everyone who wrote in this week. We're really excited to talk about some thoughts and theories that we have received. I think we're going to start with some comments from Instagram from a listener, Cookie Bowl. Um, they have been... Uh, kind of catching up with the podcast. So we won't talk about all the comments, but some of the more recent ones for some of the more the episodes in this book trilogy. Yes. Yeah. Um, I think the first one that I want to touch on is a theory that is really interesting to me. And I like the idea of it. Cookie Bowl suggests and puts through the uh, put forward the idea that Wintro seems to age really slowly. I think like, mostly referential to like Wintrow's size. Like right. he should be grown. He should be a man, but he's just a boy. And he looks, <laughs> he looks like a baby. Um, yeah. And also just seems to not be, you know, maturing as fast as people his age should, according to his father, who isn't maybe not the best judge, but I think other people also mentioned that he is small for his size, uh, but they postulate that, it's a lot like how Beloved and the and B and the other whites age. Maybe not as slow as the whites, but there is still some something reminiscent of that. And so maybe that speaks to how Wintro is a little bit more special than we think. Yeah. Cookie Bowl says uh, maybe he was born special because he has destiny to free she who remembers. Maybe he ages slowly because he has a longer lifespan. Right. It's, we don't know. I don't know if I think he is a white, but I do like the possibility of him having just a strain of it and that manifesting in this way. Some kind of, yeah, destiny, fate thing. I don't know. I personally, I'm, I'm a realist as I talk on a fantasy (laughs) podcast about a fantasy book. I'm a realist and I don't think that's true because I, I like to think that the catalysts are like with the fool's philosophy, the catalysts and people who make these decisions are just human. They're just plain people trying to make a difference or make tough choices. Yeah. So that's that's where my thoughts go to. But it is kind of interesting. To, it's a fun thought. Yeah. And I liked it a lot. And I thought I'd offer it up to the to the group. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Let everybody else know about it. But. Cookie Bowl also has a couple other comments on some things that I think are worth mentioning. Um, They mention on a comment for the episode 120, which is when we first meet Amber or Althea first meets Amber, that Amber seems to be flattered to be compared to Wood. And maybe she's even flattered about being 
compared to a live ship, but their thoughts are that the discomfort and the frustration come from Althea calling it her live ship, the my live ship aspect of it and not treating it as the like uh, its own being. Right. Which is backed up when Amber later is kind of soothed by Althea saying my live ship as in my family, not my Mm -hmm. thing that I own, which was an interesting thought because we were wondering why, uh, why Amber would recoil so much at the thought of being compared to a live ship. Right. And wizard would in general. Right. So I think that's an interesting thought that maybe it wasn't about the live ship being wrong. (laughs) It was more about the way Althea talked about her live ship. Yeah. It is a very interesting thought. And I I definitely can see both of those factors coming to play because we do have it from Amber's mouth that she felt malice coming from Wizardwood, right? Right. So I think that that combination is very, very likely. Yeah. And then finally, the last comment I want to talk about is about dragons. It's for episode 126, which is chapter 13, part two of Transitions. And Cookie Bowl talks about how they think dragon memories don't have to do with time. It's a ton of memories that they don't really think of. It only comes up when it's relevant, which I think is a really interesting way to think about the way the dragons approach the memories. Yeah. Because it does really fit with the idea that something has to bring the memory to the surface that there needs to be something that triggers the memory almost right so they can remember what to do and that's why cookie bowl also says in there that's why like the live ships have the log books to give them kind of in order to right. their memories yeah to like recall things to give a structure to that right which i think is a really interesting way to separate the two and show why live ships are able to keep things so in order and not and why Paragon's kind of floundering in his memories. Yes. Because he has two dragons and no logbook. Right. So that I thought was a really interesting way to look at the way the dragons think. And it goes into something that Ellen postulates about on Facebook. So first I'll say thank you to Cookie Bowl. All your comments have been very fun to read and we've been enjoying them. Um, and then I'll jump into Ellen's question on the most recent episode, 136, where Ellen asks how the dragons know that now is the time to go. Right. Yeah. The serpents. Like, yeah. Sorry. The serpents. Why, why is it now? And this kind of feeds into the whole conversation we were having about why are there more serpents now? Is there more activity? Are there more now? Did they come from somewhere or were they always there? Right. And Ellen Ellen kind of talks about how she thinks they were always there, but it was always talked about they were on the outside passage. And because slavery is more popular, that kind of brought them to the inside passage now. Right. Which makes sense to me. But yeah, she, she brings up that question. Why now? Why are the memories returning? Did this same seasonal shift happen every year, but we're just focusing on this time in particular? Or is there something special like the dra- the stone dragons? awoke something you know right we, we don't know for sure and definitely because you know ellen talks about how before dragons would be around to show the serpents where to go and what to do and i think it is a really good point that maybe it is the stone dragons that like triggered the memory and what made me want to transition this from cookie bowls thoughts on how the memories work for the dragon and that Something has to happen for them to know it's time, and maybe that's what happened. They're so far away, though. But we know that the (laughs) dragons flew around for a while. They didn't just go. they're not real dragons. They aren't. But from the sky. Yeah, from like Serpent's Memories, that event that something triggers, like Cookie Bowl was talking about, could bring forth those memories. Yeah, I, I don't know. I just feel like they're so far away that they wouldn't have flown that over that area i don't know i think they might have just because i i know that they kind of fly they don't just like attack the out islands and come home 
they're around for a while. So it makes sense that maybe some of them would fly out over the sea in what is the outside. Because, you know, for all we know, north of the, uh, as of Islevjal is warmer waters and that's where a lot of serpents were and so they're moving and when a Could larger be. group is coming down then that notifies the other serpents of like oh we're mass migrating and that happens whenever it's time to go to our cocoon yeah I maybe it could be yeah it's it's definitely something like an event like that could have happened i i feel like ellen's other theory here that a lot of other tangles have done this but are just lost to time Right. Might be true as well. And we can see, and we kind of know the, the passage of time for some of these, right? There was a cataclysm. Serpents could no longer find their way to the grounds where they were because right. everything had changed. So years got lost in there. And then eventually memories faded. Things got confused. And tangles even give up, become more animal-like because they don't have someone to lead or they ignored the person who was supposed to have those memories. Right. And I mean, even if you think about the first time they probably tried this, I'm sure it didn't work out. And maybe they thought, oh, maybe it, we just got it wrong. Like the timing's just wrong. And then they just never got it right. And it talks about how the serpents in the beginning of this book are kind of wanting to stay where they are because it's comfortable and there's a ton of food and it's warm. And why would we move? What's so great about leaving this area? And so, you know, with time you would forget what would be so great about leaving. So yeah, lots to think about. Thanks Ellen. Ideas. Yes. Thank you, Ellen. And we had a comment on Instagram as well, or a message on Instagram from Amir who is talking about the small magics, the priestly magics that Wintra was talking about Mm -hmm. and recalls to us in the last book when Fitz is covered in skill in silver, he's trying to make a fire and eventually just throws it down in frustration, yells fire and it happens. So skill can heal and start a fire. It's evidence in the book, but I think there's also like a fire magic that's talked about at one point. Right. That's like separate and a smaller magic. I don't know. There's just a lot of explanations. Yeah. It's definitely, I definitely forgot about Fitz just starting a fire with his mind basically. Yeah. <laughs> but maybe it is, maybe it is a skill. Who knows? It's, it's really hard to tell. Is it skill? Is it a new magic? Are all the magics intertwined? So sometimes you could tap into other ones. I don't know. Maybe it's just something you're good. You're better at that skill than others. Who knows? Also want to give a shout out to Bastion. He also commented on Facebook about the same event, actually. (laughs) So two different people chimed in about that. So thank you both for reminding us of that. And then finally, we had an email from Jonas and he also had a, uh, a Facebook comment as well saying um just quick about the the question that you posed mm-hmm. about who would who else would save the falling man that althea saved on the ship when they were being attacked by the serpent and he kind of talks about the whole vestrid family wintrow would for sure definitely and ronica might if it was a family member <laughs> yeah i can't see her doing that for any stranger <laughs> Even Devad, I feel like she would just let him go and be like, like, well, I got too much to worry about on my own and (laughs) he's too big for me to catch. (laughs) But I also really like the comment that um, Ronica might ignore them in life, but she would probably lay down her life for them. (laughs) True. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. But Jonas uh, did email us as well, talking about uh, certain things that we discussed with Etta surrounding you know the the whole consent conversation that we had at the end of last episode in this section so i guess people who skip this will not care about the context because we're talking about it in the same section but kind of talking and expanding on that conversation jonas mentions that Edda never really came to the forefront of his mind as one of the main characters or someone to linger on 
but really enjoyed the way that we framed her and, and presented her as a character and kind of digging into her a little bit more really, really loves her as a character uh, thinking about it and describes her as a bit cutthroat, which he doesn't really appreciate. But besides that, just loves her now. Very unconventional, sly with the way she oh so slightly manipulated Kenneth. She's passionate and she has the ability to be very kind, albeit in a tough love kind of way. Mentions that her life is really hard and that sort of thing up to this point. It's really interesting kind of talking about Etta as a character because same here. Like I I also didn't really focus on her on any of my rereads. I'm like, yeah, Etta's here. She's great. She's like the pirate queen, but never really focused on her, even though I think maybe in the second or might be the third book, we get really some deep dives on her and Wintro. Yeah. When they start talking more about like the Wintro stuff. <laughs> right. That's so interesting to me because I think I really liked Etta from the start. Like I found her so brave. What like from the very beginning when she asks Kenneth to take her to a home and says, you know, like I'll take care of a house for you. I'll do whatever you want. Just get me out of here. And I like, I just found that so intriguing that like, yeah. who is this woman? I want to know more about her. I want to know her goals and like why she acts the way that she does and why this is like a better life than what she's going through now. And I don't know. So I'm, I'm glad I could share my love of this character. If I can't convince everybody to be happy with Fitz and Molly, I'll settle for people <laughs> liking Etta more. <laughs> <laughs> Jonas also talks about looking forward to pretty much the start of what we talked about in this chapter yeah. with Wintrow with him being at his lowest point. Wow, he's about to heap, hit his deepest moments in the series in Jonas's opinion and he'll be on his way to find his inner strength. How he still, you know, strives to be the priest of Sa and everything like that and he kind of finds his groove, he finds his center eventually but this is kind of the lowest point for him or the start of the lowest points for yeah, him it gets worse <laughs> yeah just a little bit worse before it gets a little bit better but also worse <laughs> right it's a hob oh. book of course <laughs> and uh one last thing that jonas does talk about is paragon we were talking about how Paragon felt a need to kill the crew and says like, oh, don't sail me. I'll have to kill you all again. And we were kind of talking about that when mm -hmm. Mingsley was walking away, being happy to maybe have a purchaser for, uh, for Paragon. And Jonas does bring up the good point that he is another person with a obsession towards Kenneth, like Wintrow and right. uh, Ada have in the future. And that devotion makes Paragon want to stay dead and not float because he's supposed to be dead. He wants to fulfill that promise that he made to Kenneth. So that would be another reason on that or for, uh, for Paragon to roll over and kill the crew. Right. Yeah, definitely some interesting thoughts to think of and to think about with regards to Paragon and to watch out for in the future. It's all, all good thoughts. I guess I don't know if that's fair to say. Yeah, I was going to say it's all coming up Millhouse, but no, neither of those are true. It no. is not coming up and it is not good thoughts. A, <laughs> they're good ideas. <laughs> yes, yeah. The thoughts, the, the content, maybe not so good. <laughs> We're kind of diving into the sad. meat of the books now. I know. This is where it finally gets good, I feel like. Finally. I know. Well, we just spent so long... We've had exciting Figuring out chapters. The world. Yes. I, I agree yeah. with you. We've had exciting chapters and moments, but nothing really happens until Wintrow gets back on Vivacia and then Kenneth takes Vivacia. Yeah. Like, really. Like, nothing really gets going until then. So. It's all set up. <laughs> yeah. No, this is definitely my favorite part of a Robin Hobb book. Although, you know, we're going to get to the next book and have the lull again. But <laughs> at least we're in these last couple chapters where. It's going to be action, action, action. Last so, couple, we probably have like 10 more. Well, that's about when it starts getting action, action, action. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you everyone who messaged us and who wrote in. 
As always, it's lovely to hear from you and we are excited to hear what you think next week. 